when Ryan and I killed that bull, that, uh, that was interesting, you know, shooting a big Magnum in an ultralight chassis over magnified and man, it was just a, an absolute shit show and got the elk killed. Right. I mean, the elk is dead and that was an aha moment for me because that wasn't going to happen again. Donald Trump here. We ran right over Nikki Haley. Sleepy Joe, wakey, wakey. We're coming for you next. But I'm here to endorse the Shoot to Hunt podcast. It's the best. Just ask the people. Look at the people. The beautiful people. Give it up for Jake, the beauty giant, and Ryan, the elk slayer. Well, so that's probably where to start, right? Yeah. With this whole thing is... um might be why i would suggest or i'm not gonna talk about my background and why i would suggest chris doesn't really and why i know dan won't Mm -hmm. but because it leads to appeal to authority Mm -hmm. either way right so if i'm trying not to use somebody let's say i come in and i work for some super cool unit for the government and I was a sniper. Well, you would go, okay, that's why we should listen to him. Mm. Well, what does that mean? Do you know what that means? Mm. Do you have any idea what the standards are to achieve that? Actually, I understand more about it now in my later life that it's not as, but it's not as badass as you think it is. Well, yeah, but like, yeah. like, like, oh, I was a X insert sniper for mm. some, whatever you think the greatest unit is. Mm. Does that, how does that translate? First off, what does that mean? Yeah. What standards was I held to to achieve it? What skill does that mean I have? What knowledge does that mean I have? What does that mean for you? Let's take like a professor, for example. If you were a, if you're a professor of microbiology at MIT, mm-hmm. well, you've already proven yourself simply with your title because you understand that so it there's takes a, PhDs so there's and whatnot. So there's a difference there. Oh. You can go look up at what that takes. Well, when you listen to X, I was in X unit. You're trusting on faith with zero information. Yes. What happens if, so here's an interesting thing. There's a lot of people that will listen to the podcast or in this world that will be like, I don't trust the government, mm-hmm. right? Big government is bad or they, you know, they lie, they cheat, they, they, it, they're not what they say they are. Um, you understand that it applies to the military too, right? Mm-hmm. They're a part of the government. They're ran by the government mm-hmm. and I'm not picking on the military. I'm saying, why do we have blind faith in anything, especially to appeal to authority when you have people like Frank Gailey and Kalen Woljack, I think he even said it, but there's all these former and current quote unquote mill snipers that point out how few rounds they actually shot, how little they actually trained, how they didn't know anything when they went to their first match and they got stomped. Mm-hmm. So how does that title like? You're just trusting on faith from what I would say, if you believe the, unless you believe the government is complete and that's the whole industry of the government, everything to do with it, unless you believe they're completely trustworthy, you don't need to question them. You don't need to look into it, blah, blah, blah. If you, if you say that you can just trust them no matter what it is. Okay, fine. We don't really have anything in common probably. And we're not going to go there. If you do say, I need to trust, but verify or question or whatever, then you have to do it with everything. Mm. So why are you just saying, well, X unit or X title means this skill level? Because you don't know what that skill level is. Yeah. What, what is. What is the first shot hit requirement at 800 meters for a, a United States Marine Corps sniper, by the way, which they disbanded? Don't know. No fucking clue. Yeah. What about an Army sniper? No clue. Mm. What's How many rounds do they shoot a year? No clue. Well, there's actually a thing called an ammo allocation table. Like Each branch calls it differently. If you can find the document and look it up, it's shockingly low. I shot more rounds in that yesterday alone that they get in a year. Mm-hmm. So can you, can you be a... I don't want to harp on them because there's, there's phenomenal dudes everywhere. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the, the title doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean what people think it means especially when you don't know the quote unquote secret sauce that it took to achieve that. Mm. I, I know that, give me a sports. I don't watch sports. Soccer. 
Who's a, who's the best How soccer player? How the fuck player? is soccer the first thing that come out of your mouth? Look Give me a sport. You watch soccer? Know. Pele. No. no. Pele. Is he a soccer guy? Soccer. Yeah, old old school pe- soccer. Oh. I don't know any of So give me somebody in, in sports. League. <laughs> in sports. Uh, that LeBron we know. James. What's that? LeBron James. Okay. Would you say LeBron James know how to play basketball? Is he a soccer player? No, he's a basketball player. Football. Football. That's the one where he goes. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Go! Could you say LeBron James knows how to play basketball? Yes. Why? Uh, because Did you see he's him on the paid world? fucking millions of dollars so to that's be on the most why. professional team. That's not why you know, though. You know because you can turn the TV on and the watch him play. playing yeah. against the best players in the world. Yeah. What dude from what unit have you gotten to see do that? Mm. None. Yeah. None. There are none. You're trusting them on their word, or it's not even their word. It's a reputation that may or may not exist. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that that doesn't mean anything. I'm saying, saying I did X doesn't mean anything, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't say, hey, shoot a 5.56 with 77 gram TMKs because I'm me, you should trust me. I go, no, here's the gun, here's the animals, here's the gel, this is how I did it, you guys go out and recreate it. Mm -hmm. Then people like Chris go out and recreate it and go, oh, it worked. Right, so I'm showing my work, so it wouldn't matter if it's from me or a computer that said it, because the goal is just to provide as much as of a data based approach, not an opinion or my version of of mm-hmm. reality approach. Right. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I would say is like appeal to authority is a fallacy. It's one of the biggest fallacies that happens, and it's one of the quickest and fastest ways to have a logical breakdown and to lose critical thought. Because you are just saying, because X person is this, don't question it. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong, right? I could, let me think how to say this. How how, how would you choose which shooting course, which shooting class of all the available 75 in the fucking country? How would you choose So like hunting courses or just in general? Well, we already established there's not a hunting based course, right? So like, let's let's look at pistols, right? Uh So I, I shoot pistols. So I have a base knowledge of what to do with a pistol. Now, it might be higher than some or lower than some or whatever, but I can look at that and I can go, okay, I have a base knowledge of what should be important. Then I go and I look at what this company or this person, what is their skill level with a pistol? So let's say I go to something just super easy, USPSA, and I'm a C-class USPSA shooter. I'm probably not going, so C-class is towards the bottom of Mm -hmm. ranking. I'm probably not going to take a class from a dude who's a D-class or a C-class USPSA shooter. Mm. I'm just going to go to the top guy. Yeah, but now we're going back to shit that's measurable. That's correct, right? So the issue here is it's squishy because hunting isn't measurable Mm -hmm. unless you get massive data sets, right? Because you could go, well, form has never killed a 380-inch bull, and I haven't. Mm. okay cool i've killed four okay well i only kill like five by fives and four by fours Mm -hmm. and every once in a while a six by six well obviously the other guy's a better hunter right except he goes to arizona on the reservation and pays forty thousand dollars a year to shoot him out of a pickup truck Uh all of mine comes six and a half seven miles back in in massively over hunted public land does that mean i'm a good hunter no but you until you know what's behind the thing you're applying authority to, I wouldn't use that at all Mm -hmm. for that. Whether Chris has shot 80 Boone and Crockett bucks or none has nothing to do with whether he can teach somebody to shoot a rifle correctly and quickly, Mm -hmm. right? So until we get a standard going and people can see it, there's going to be a little bit of like you have to read between the lines and go off of what people say. So I can listen to Chris And in fact, that's how Chris and I met and go, Chris is intelligent. He's articulate. The things he says makes me understand he's thinking through this process and he's not regurgitating just something he read. And when confronted with conflicting information, he doesn't dismiss it out of hand. He ruminates on it. He thinks about it. He does a little bit of research. He comes back and he gives a logical uh, answer or response, whether it's for or against the idea, right? And unfortunately, hunting is kind of the same way, right? I mean, we just spent a weekend with Dione. Um, Now, Dione has a reputation for killing a lot of big deer. 
having I I just took that at face value before I you know met him in person. I talked to him on the phone. The dude's smart. He to me, from what I know of hunting deer, he knows what he's talking about. But I still don't go. Well, Dione said it, so we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Right? You should hunt this way because Dione said it, or because Robbie Denning said it. Because I don't know Robbie personally, and even if I did, how much of that is real? Right? But now that I've met and spent time with Dione. I can see his mannerisms, and I always thought this by what he posts and what he says, that he's an intelligent, articulate dude who thinks through things. So the odds are he's probably correct. That's how I go about it. Mm. So then I go, he's probably correct, and if I have no other source of information, I'll take his advice because I got nothing to refute it. But the moment I can tease that out or prove it, I'm going to. I'm not going to go, well, Dione killed the the biggest mule deer in Idaho last year, so he's the best mule deer hunter. Mm -hmm. Having spent a few days with him, I think Dione knows how to how to kill big mule deer. That's no my <laughs> yeah. that's my my perception of his personality is I understand why you are doing this every single year now. Mm. Right? So what I think somebody goes um from a course is you know, it's hard cuz right you kind of take it as well it's form or it's Ryan or it's Jake or it's Chris or whatever. And I would say that's the wrong way to think about it. I would say it's got, this is a group of everybody to varying degrees, but psychotic hunters who centered their life around it, who also shoot. Some of us like me shoot, you know, historically through my life shot as much as I hunted, which is a lot. Uh, Maybe Ryan didn't shoot as much and he hunted more. But all the shooting was central. Like shooting was for hunting. That's what it was for, Mm. right? It wasn't, I didn't shoot in this context so I could win a PRS match. I might have shot PRS matches or PRS style matches. I might have won them. But it was for being better able to kill animals on demand, Mm. right? And so that's where I would go with that. And if you read what Ryan writes and you read what uh, Chris writes, and um, you might just call bullshit on what I write, and that's cool. You should. Um, I think anyone with a clue picks that up, even if you don't like it, like it comes through, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have to meet you to know that at least get a pretty good idea that you weren't going to bullshit me about your guns, Mm -hmm. right? Just the little bit you write and a little bit you talk. We're all wrong about things at times. We all say dumb shit, Mm -hmm. whatever. That's not the, the general characterization of a person. You listen to the whole thing and you make a judgment, you know, and as far as, You know, I would, I don't know if I should even say this, but I will. Like, if you come to the course and you think it was a waste of time, okay, I give you your money back. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Talking about for Jake? No. I said, he ain't paying shit. No, I'm talking about that we should should put a 100% satisfaction guarantee on. No, I don't know about that because I'm an asshole. But Mm -mm. like, if, if you come and you don't get anything out of it and you don't improve, dude, I'll pull three, I'll pull three grand out of my pocket and give it to you. Mm -hmm. Cause, if you didn't improve, it means you're better than me, and I'll pay you three thousand dollars to teach me. Mm-hmm. So it's a win-win for me. Like, I mean, I didn't know Chris very long, and in another context, he was better at a subject, and I asked if he would teach it to the guys that were there to learn from me about something. I don't know if you remember that, right? Why? Because he's better. I don't care if he's better. Let him teach it. Not an ego-based thing, right? I don't know what you got for that, man, but no, you know, and one of the things that, uh, this entire course is about is establishing those fundamentals and developing a process to be a more efficient killer, uh, in the field. And that's something that a lot of courses out there don't teach you how to do. They teach you a process of how to be a trigger presser and they give you some information on environmentals and how to figure out dope. Uh, but they don't establish that fundamental process that's required to be an effective big game hunter in the Western mountains. When you are actually a field and an animal presents itself, Mm. there is a best practice that has been developed and that's, what's trying to get expressed to members that come to this course. And it is absolutely eye opening when you, when you come and participate in a week at a shoot to hunt course over what you've learned at other courses, other long range. This isn't a long range shooting course. This, that's not the intent of this course at all. This course is to teach you how to become a rifleman. And that is something that is 
so many guys overlook. You think, oh, I shoot a lot. Well, going to the range and getting your bags out, getting on a bench and shooting, you know, at one to 1,000 yards off of a bench with a very uh, predictable environment and a very predictable process that you can demonstrate and you see it time and time again on a bench at the range where guys, they're looking through their spotting scope, they're looking through their rifle scope, they're working on adjusting their turrets, uh, they go through this entire process, they deliver a shot. And then they slowly extract the round, they catch the brass in their hand, they put it back in their box. That is not at all what this course is about. This course is about spotting your target and running through the, the, the process to deliver that first round hit on that big game animal in field conditions, from field positions, whether it's standing, seated unsupported, seated supported, prone, using your backpack, using a bino harness, using shooting sticks. It is, it's a course like no other. And it is absolutely eye-opening the very first evening that you're in this course and we go out and we run through actual hunting scenarios where guys have, have killed big game animals from the previous year. We'll pull guys. We'll say, Jake, tell us about uh, an animal that you killed last year. And mm -hmm. you'll have five guys give scenarios. And the very first thing that we do is we recreate those scenarios based on distance, elevation, shot angles, the time, the circumstances of the shot, how the shot was taken. And we'll give everybody an opportunity under a time hack to go through and recreate those shots. That's the baseline for establishing what you think, you know, or what you think you're capable of doing a field on the very first night. And then from that point, we stop and we start the course the next day and go through the entire fundamental process of how to deliver those shots a field. And by the end of the week, there is nobody that hasn't seen market improvement in their ability to actually execute on those big game animals and those shots, mm -hmm. you know? So. Nice. Well, and, I, and on that, right. And kind of back to the, the teachers of, I would, I would say like, if you, if you come for a specific person, that's part of the problem with the training industry is you're going for a, uh, a personality mm -hmm. instead of the information. You don't go to MIT because of some specific professor that you want to get a certificate from. You go to MIT because MIT has a reputation and proven results that you can meet people that have been there that have knowledge, skill, and ability, right? So it's an institution that you're buying, if you want to say it that way, you're buying into. You're trusting the institution enough to pay them to educate you. And that's the kind of the way I would think it. And you go to courses and the quote unquote instructors, right, which I we wouldn't, I'm not an instructor and I don't, none of our guys are called that because instructors stand at a PowerPoint and tell you what to do. Um, there's a difference between an instructor, a teacher and a coach and we're teachers and coaches, right? Like you're getting one-on-one -on -one coaching of how to correct this problem. But while you're doing that, all of us are doing everything you're doing and more right beside you under the same conditions. You will see us miss. You will see us go over time. You will see us fail. It's not yeah, oh, I missed a shot and blah, blah, blah. No, it's like, you're going to see it real time. We do it right beside you. When you fail, we take your equipment. We see if we can recreate it or fix it or find what the problem is, right? So I guess with all of it is it's just different. It's killing on demand and then building the process up from the ground of like, this is a rifle. This is a scope. We start from there and it builds all the way to the end where you don't, I don't tell anybody what to do. It's like, there's your target, go. <clears throat> and it's just, it's at that point, it's repetitive. And it's, it's a target and it's a timer. Almost everything is timed. There's almost, you know, other than the, the fundamentals or the, the base process, almost nothing is done without a timer attached to it. So speed matters. And it really does start at the base, uh, like Form was saying, that, you know, building a delivery system, building a robust delivery system around a proper projectile and talking through that entire process and why it matters. And then you have guys that show up to these courses, to this class with incredibly high end custom rifles. I mean, you'll, you'll have a guy show up with a $8,000 custom rifle and by day, the end of day one, uh, he's already made different choices on what he's going to do for his next build mm -hmm. and have had guys literally on break, get on their cell phone and call and purchase a different delivery system right there on lunch because what they've learned in the first day 
is completely contrasting with everything that they thought they had known in the past based on their experiences, what they've read, what their peers do, et cetera. Because once they're actually placed in the position of field to be able to hit on demand, it's not working for them. Mm -hmm. it, it just simply is not as effective as what they're being taught and what's being demonstrated. So starting with that projectile, starting with that delivery system from the rifle, why certain things matter and why certain things matter in, in the field environment specifically, mm -hmm. the difference between MOA and mills and, you know, what are the pros and cons and how are they actually proven in the field on what's most effective. And guys learn really quickly that, uh, their entire rifle world is shattered because everything that the gun riders have written, you know, since the days of field and stream, outdoor life, sports, of field, et cetera. Now everything coming online and boy, when you're required to get out there in the field and demonstrate under a little bit of pressure in field conditions, things are different. Mm -hmm. And there is a best practice and there are best practices on how to deliver on demand effectively. And one of the things that I really like about this is that once this foundation is laid and you understand what a projectile is, is, is designed to do at certain impact velocities with lowest foot pounds of recoil felt recoil. So you have the highest hit rates out of a reliable delivery system and you know how to be effective inside of 600 on demand with certain practice throughout the re throughout the year and disciplined practice throughout the year to maintain those skills that frees up a lot of time for me to concentrate on things that really matter. And that is how do I go out there and find the game animals that I'm looking for? I can focus on hunting and being a good hunter, finding those bucks and bulls and, and animals that I'm interested in chasing mm -hmm. because I have taken a huge, taken a huge part of the equation and developed a process and a system that is dependable, reliable, and predictable and if I make a mistake in my first round, it doesn't hit where I intended. I can immediately correct and make a second round hit no. immediately, <laughs> you know, so you can focus on the important things in the process and not get so, so gear centric, so to speak. I mean, once you know what works, just stick with what works. Enhance your shooting experience with stocky stocks. Are you tired of struggling with mediocre rifle stocks that hinder your performance? Imagine having a high quality rifle stock that not only enhances your accuracy, but also provides superior strength and a lightweight build. Stocky Stocks offers a wide range of premium rifle stocks manufactured with hand layup carbon fiber construction, a patented carbon fiber AccuBlock, and multiple finish options. Whether you're a long range shooter or a hunting enthusiast, our stocks are perfect for you. Experience unmatched precision and durability with Stocky Stocks. We provide stock installation instructions, technical support, and guidance to help you choose the right stock for your rifle. Upgrade your shooting game today with Stocky Stocks. Unlike, unlike Ryan, who's building a rifle every other week. <laughs> oh, that's all right. He likes <laughs> no, that a, stuff. A story that Ryan told me the other day that kind of resonated with what you were just saying is when he went out and he killed that elk in uh, Wyoming this last season. Is how he did it. He did all this work. He went in two times. I should let you tell the story, but he went in two times. And then uh, when you finally had the elk that you wanted in your scope, you said that I already knew it was over. Like that level of confidence in it's your shooting and your in, yeah in in your in your weapon system and your abilities as a shooter. And you've been practiced, and you know you just went out and checked your rifle right before you came, and you got a scope that can stand to be dropped a little bit and all that good shit. You know that once the elk is in your sight, that it's fuck it's fucking over. Yeah, when when uh, Justin came up to me after I shot that elk, he's like, "That was a that was a good shot," because I didn't know he's walking up with the goats when I pulled the trigger, and he's like, "Were you nervous?" I was like, "Nope." I said, "I knew his day was done. Yeah. It was over." But to get this in digestible chunks, this is usually not how we do a podcast. Just kind of information explosion. Yeah. Like going back to Shoot Hunt University, it wasn't going to be a part when we started Shoot Hunt. It was just a podcast. But the more I got around for him, and the more, you know, rock slide, you know, kind of morphs it's we are not well-rounded marksmen and we think we are i was i'm really good ambush shooting but what forum has kind of showed me and i've and i don't want to throw chris under the bus and i don't want to throw my uncle randy under the bus but i got to tell two stories <laughs> that's okay because there's some good ones that come out there is and <laughs> and my uncle randy we've told that story on here and and he <laughs> ended up shooting 17 times at an elk it was it 17 yeah, 17. yeah it was 14 he had an absolute come apart because he had very and in, in my, in my, in retrospect, it was somewhat my fault. People, he was not properly trained to do that. He shouldn't have taken those shots. 
and he lost his mind. And I think he came out to the class last year and it was a world of difference. When he oh, first yeah. started, he was horrendous in the class. By the end of the week, he was pretty confident, I think, out to four or 500 yards. Oh, that, that, you know, it was 14 with his 300 PRC. Mm-hmm. And then we had to go get him another gun and he kills the oak with a six mil. That, that would have been a one to two shot affair after the course. I mean, it was. Mm-hmm. But he mentally checked out halfway through with his yep. 300 PRC. Oh, he was done. Like and he was, he I wouldn't even say mentally checked out. Every nerve ending was fried to where mm-hmm. people just like, they almost give up. Like when a dog has just ran too hard, too much, too fast. Being on full tilt. That's yep. right. They full just fall tilt. over. That actual break we had to walk back to the truck to helped get Forum's re-center. gun helped him calm the fuck down yep. and say, okay, I can do this. And Forum, he's very good at talking you through what you need to do while you're shooting. And he was worried about canting or whatever he kept saying <laughs> in the video. And he just, he, that. 30 minutes, unfortunately, for the elk had to stand there wounded, and that sucks on that's that's on us. We shouldn't be doing that shit. But we came back, he was ready, he was focused. Forum's gun, that little bastard, that little wooden gun is a lot easier to shoot than his 300 PRC. And he made it happen. Well, Chris was in a fil- we were in a similar situation. Yep. Elk hunting. And Chris made a shot, he hit it high, and the elk got back on his feet and he had a middle, he had a little mental come apart. And it was it was a long shot, seven, eight hundred yards. And he got his shit together. We killed the elk. We got it was dead. But what I've seen from this class is it takes the, I wouldn't say voodoo, but it takes the mental, oh, I gotta make this shot out of it. And now I would say Chris is an absolute killer. I mean, your form, you've you're the one that's watching all this happen. Would you say he is spot on? Oh, oh, oh. Chris from has, when you first seen him to Chris now. has turned into probably one of the best on demand. Uh, you know, I don't want to overstate this. I hate that he's here, so he hears this. But uh, <laughs> probably one of the best on-demand rifle killers um, that I'm around. Like what I see with Chris now is when he wants. There's no when he wants to kill it, it's dead. Right. So the the re- the very next animal I think or that I saw after that event, after he came through and shot the course and and learned right is was it 912 910 910 uh we were trying to get on these elk it didn't work like the the timing people have this idea that long range gives you all the time in the world and sometimes it does right but i've said this before cow elk late season cow elk is the best training for hunting that exists because it's the hardest thing to do a lone bull walking or a bull with some cows is no big deal when you have 400 eyes looking at you and they're in a huge herd it takes a lot more mental Everything's got to be dialed and a lot more mental processing power to make sure, you know, the animal you're shooting at is the correct animal. It's, there's nothing behind it, nothing in front of it to track it when it runs into the herd, all these things. And, uh, the other people we were with, like, just couldn't get down on these elk in time. And they're moving, you know, started at like five something and they moved to six, moved to seven, moved to eight. And I can't remember. Finally, I think I just told Chris like, Hey, it's you back went down. He loads the gun. I mean, we got it on video. But I laugh because in the video, and this is talking about that control piece, you can only shoot. There's two things you're competing against, right? So we want to shoot when we're comfortable, but the animal is reactive. It tells us when we have a window to shoot, right? So you only shoot when you can, and that might mean that you lose opportunities at animals. That's where the practice and the training comes in, that I shoot sooner at the same hit rate, if that makes sense, right? So I just remember with Chris on that one, like my brain, I'm spotting, he lays down dials. I mean, I don't know, the whole thing was probably 12 seconds. And, uh, you know, I range at nine, 10, he dials up, I say ready. And uh, I think he just took like one breath or two breaths and let it out. And I, was, I said something like, Chris, you gotta hurry up. And he just fucking ignored me, which is the right answer. He's doing his part, right? And um, so, He tells me and I give him the wind call and he smokes it. And the cow moves like 10 feet or I don't even remember if she moved. She moved a little bit. A little bit. He racks, bam, hits her again. I mean, they're they're, they're a couple inches apart. And then she runs like 30 yards and he's already racked and like tracking her. And he tracks her with the gun all the way until he can't see her behind the ridge. Like there was no breakdown in the process. And so we go from us kind of being hectic, trying to get other people on these elk because we had a big, you know, three or four people with tags to Chris it's on. And then 20 seconds later, we got a dead elk ish 20 seconds. I don't even know if it was that a dead elk at almost a thousand yards. And the thing is there was zero doubt in my mind what the outcome of that was. Like my wind call was good. I knew my wind call was going to be good. 
And I don't, there was no doubt in my mind that Chris was going to do it. There's no evidence of stress at all that I could see from you. I don't No, It was, it was automatic. It was just the entire process and system that had been developed and refined over the years between those two separate events. When Ryan and I killed that bull, that, uh, that was interesting, you know, shooting a big Magnum in an ultralight chassis over magnified and man, it was just a, an absolute shit show and got the elk killed. Right. I mean, the elk is dead and that was an aha moment for me because that wasn't going to happen again. That, that entire process, even though the end result was the same, the way we got there was markedly mm -hmm. different and I was not going to let that happen again. And we had the conversation. It's like, you need to learn how to pack animals and I need to learn how to shoot. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what's happened since that point. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, the degree of confidence, the field and just being able to effectively kill big game animals in those environments is what this is all about for me. Because again, that's a part of the process. Sure. But if you're chasing 200 inch bucks or, you know, 380 inch bulls or whatever the case may be, or, if, or even cows to fill the freezer, that's the enjoyable part. Let's figure that out. Let's get a field. Let's I want, go scout. I want the gun Let's, stuff to be completely subconscious yeah, and it's automatic. not a consideration, right? Like it's very easy. I like guns. They're cool and all they that. Fun. When it comes to hunting, I don't, I care no more about my rifle than I do my sit pad. In fact, I probably care more about the sit pad because I'm sitting on it all the time. <laughs> right. Like I just, it, it has to work correctly. That's right. And then we want our brain to where the shot is completely, like you said, anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. There is nothing about shooting to me that causes an emotional event in any way. And I, that's what it should be. The moment I say, I want to shoot this animal, or I want to kill this animal. It is now a shot. The hunt has ended. I don't care if it's 17 yards with my stupid Asiatic recurve, or if it's 780 yards on a bull or a cow or whatever, like the moment you say, I'm ready to shoot, it should just, everything should be over. It's just a shot at that point until it's on the ground. Correct. And the reason going back to the reason for true town university is these are not two isolated incidents. We hunt a lot. I see yeah. this happen year in and year out. And then you tell these stories and people tell you their stories of yeah. epic fuck ups. So we're not well-rounded this course. And, and if you would at that moment with Chris or shooting with my uncle Randy, I'd be like, I don't know how you fix this. But then I went through the course yeah. and I'm biased. I think Chris is probably the least biased in here. The three of us are biased. Well, you haven't been to class. You're fucking first year this year, Jake. <laughs> but that class takes so much. It shows you what you can get away with and it shows you all the positions you're going to do it in. Cause I, like I said, I was an ambush hunter. So I thought, oh fuck, I'm, I'm a good shooter. Well, one day with forum showed me, I'm not that good a shooter when I'm taken out of my comfort zone. And this class takes you out of your comfort zone every day. And by the end you're like, well, fuck now I know I can do and I can't do. Right. So I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. The other thing is it gives you a lot of field expedient rules, right? When it, it was really eye opening to me when you start talking about, uh, You've got your delivery system, you've got your bullet, you've got a reliable scope that holds zero, returns to zero, dials precisely, does everything a scope should. You've got this robust delivery system. You've got a projectile that is going to give you your desired wound channel with adequate depth of penetration at the lowest felt recoil for the highest hit rates. That's taken care of, right? So how do you get out there after you learn these fundamentals of proper shooting position and how to deliver the shot sequence? You also learn wind brackets quick drops, field expedient calculations. I don't need Ryan's uh, shooter app in his drop sheet necessarily. If we're hunting together, I just need to know what gun and what bullet he's shooting so that I can figure out whether it's an average gun, a good gun, a bad gun, and what a mile an hour wind bracket that he's shooting. So that if he's the shooter and I'm the spotter, we're running through our systematic process. We have a language that we speak to, that is consistent. Words mean things. We teach that process in terms of Shooter's responsibilities and lingo and language to communicate with the spotter, the spotter's responsibilities and language to communicate with the shooter. And if I know whether Ryan's shooting a good gun, I can figure in his wind bracket, as I'm ranging that animal, I know what the drops are to hit that animal uh, in the field, as well as a wind bracket so that I, as a spotter, can give him his elevation and give him his wind correction and command to fire and 
it, it is a process that is designed strictly around big game hunting and how to be effective a field. And what happens when it's foggy or it's raining or it's snowing and you can't get a precise reading with your laser range finder? Is there a way to effectively determine the range and deliver a shot at that animal and hit that animal? Absolutely there is. And those are things that oftentimes get overlooked in terms of how do you do those, those, how do you do milling and how do you in inclement weather when you're still able to hunt, how are, can you still be effective a field? Mm. So there's a lot of stuff in this entire course that it, it simply, it is strictly designed around big game Western hunting and it will make you a more effective hunter, whether you hunt out of a box blind in Oklahoma or whether you're hunting uh, down in the Frank Church wilderness in the back country of Idaho, you are going to be a more effective hunter based on what you're learning and the takeaways out of this course. Mm. There's no question. Nice. Yeah, and it's 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 for everybody. It's not just for, you know, everybody can't shoot NRL hunter. There's guys that'll never shoot a competition in their life. And I do play, I do think like the NRL hunter will be great for most people, but there's just some guys that are never going to do that. So right. like my uncle Randy Eaton, he's never going to shoot an NRL hunter, but he can come to these classes and he can get remarkably better. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing too, right? Because um, what's the most common shooting position in an NRL hunter? It's in the pro. Okay. What's the second most common? Probably kneeling. Off a tripod? Off tripod Off or tripod. triple pull. Off a triple pull, right? Yep. So unfortunately, even the, uh, even the field hunting competition thing starts to look a little gamey. And when I say gamey, gaming is not bad. Game everything, right? But mm -hmm. When you have something where it's like, hey, if you just shoot from prone or a tripod, you're, you're making every shot. I mean, I, I guess if you ambush hunt, you can do that, right? But there's a whole lot of sheep hunters that aren't doing that. There's a whole lot of mountain goat hunters that aren't doing that, elk hunters that aren't doing that. Mm -hmm. And even if you say, I will do that, you're giving up opportunities if that's your shooting, right? But that's like, the biggest thing that I've saw seen in the last five years is I ambushed hunt a lot when I first started long range hunting. Yeah. I was giving up animals. Mm -hmm. I was, cause I was sitting in a spot all day long and I knew there was probably animals in such and such a spot, but it'd be tight. It'd be quick. And I wasn't doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, think about even to that ambush hunting thing. Think about that one buck that was chasing does during the rut on that one hunt that you were on when you were backpacked in and that buck, he's on this face. And he's pushing does and he's moving and he's moving and he's moving and you're having to make and break position and you were unable to get a position built and get that deer killed because you hadn't been through this course yet. And if you think about the takeaways from what you've learned since that time and since now, there's no question in my mind that you would have killed that buck uh, based on what you've told me. Mm -hmm. Just simply, even if you're an ambush hunter and if you're hunting during the rut and those deer are, are active and pushing and cruising. And you may spot that animal on that, on that hill face and then have the opportunity to get on him, figure out the distance, make your position. And as that deer is still moving, when there's a pregnant pause in his movement and he is asking for that, that, that shot, uh, deliver it because you're going to be able to do that. Right. So it applies to ambush hunting as well, but it also applies to spot and stalk hunting or just any type of, yeah. of hunting, honestly. And again, it goes right back to the box blind in Oklahoma type thing. If you get deer that are moving across some of these big, open, broken terrain uh, features that are there and they're in the rut, it's one thing if you're shooting off a feeder, you know, or something like that, that's a whole nother ball game. But if you have deer that are cruising and you need to make and break position and you have varying distances and you're trying to figure out, especially as you start getting longer distances and potentially some wind that you have to deal with, this is applicable. And what you're going to learn here is applicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've learned two. First of all, that was the biggest deer I've ever seen on the hoof that I could shoot at. And I learned two valuable lessons, smart range finding binoculars, because mm -hmm. I would have probably killed them that way and fucking quick, quick drop. Mm -hmm. Those two things that deer would be dead. Right. Really just quick drop that deer would have been dead. Were you shooting M MOA or Mills that day? It's definitely you know, MOA. See, that's another problem, right? Yep. It's like a focal point too, yep. I bet. Yep. So <laughs> again, it comes back to that entire killing system, right? So just poking <laughs> holes in Ryan's story again, because he may have killed that deer just with the, the advantages of a, uh, a quality set of range finding binoculars and not having to go through that extra process of, you know, handheld range finder, et cetera. But the quick drop with the mills and the wind brackets and that distance, and then shooting a lower, a lower recoiling 
projectile. It's mm-hmm. there's a lot there's a lot to it, and it's really actually pretty simple once you learn the foundation and the and the basics and the fundamentals of this entire process. Oh, fast forward five years, that that deer would not be. It'd be on my wall. I'd be, he'd be eating it on my wall. Hundred <laughs> percent. No doubt. I did another. I learned another valuable lesson the next day. I shot a deer across the same drainage and damn near died in the river. <laughs> yeah, you did actually. Yeah. Glad you didn't. Yeah. So a lot of lessons that week. Uh, Jake, you're awful quiet. Well, as the one that hasn't been in the course, you know, I had my objective questions that I already asked, and uh, yeah. yeah, hope to uh, see it in action this year and be a better I think, hunter. Yeah, I think it'll be, I, even even your uh, GM said yesterday that he's probably something he should go to, which I about fell over. I told Forb yesterday, Blaine came in, he says, I should probably go to that. And I don't know I if don't, he wants to shoot or he just wants to fuck off. I was going to say, I don't need Blaine going <laughs> fucking breaking a hip, you know, as he's trying to get down <laughs> in the prone position. You know, and that's something that when you come, Jake, and, and to anybody that hasn't been here, just come with an open mind and just come and bring what, bring your hunting gear, bring what you use, bring your delivery systems, bring, bring everything you need that you're going to go to a, go a field with, bring the ammo, come shoot. And you know, we're going to teach you how to crush it and well, come with an op- teach us, come with yeah. an open mind and please teach us what, what we don't know. And, you know, please just come with an open mind because it truly is one of those things after the first day, the first time that I ever went through this process at the end of the first day, I'm just shaking my head that everything that I have learned since I began hunting back in the eighties, that it's all just not been true. And well, and the key to that is that wasn't because somebody told you it wasn't true. That nobody told me anything. That's because you get to step up and go, well, I did just say sometimes you got to shoot a deer in five seconds. Why did it just take me two and a half minutes? That's right. And it's not Something ain't right. Nobody told me anything. And yeah. Somebody showed me something and <laughs> demonstrated something and then given the opportunity to get down there and go through that shot mm-hmm. myself and my inability to complete that task in a timely fashion was clearly evident and uh, that I needed to do things differently in order to be successful or have a higher degree of success and a repeatable degree of success. Mm-hmm. So anyway, you know, people I hear all the time is why, why didn't we know this before? Well, it's a lot like the national media, the gun mags controlled everything. So what you learned was from a gun writer that was paid by such blank X company to write about that product. Mm-hmm. They got paid off of that product. So they were only going to turn it into a light where this comes back to, we need mushrooming bullets and you need big three thirty eights for everything. Well, now the internet's out there and as bad as some of the shit is on the internet, there's a lot of good truths that are coming out from the internet. Mm -hmm. And this is one of them. Smaller calibers, you know, more well-rounded shooter, uh, mono suck for killing animals, you know, shit like that. That's a whole other fucking, (laughs) that's a whole other. He he inserts the uh, (laughs) seven millimeter monos, right? Yes. Oh, they're the fucking worst. Except for 195 EOLs, they're the fucking worst bullet on the planet. (laughs) (laughs) So we understand that not everybody can take a week off and spend a grip of money to come shoot with us. So that's the best way in person training, you know, you form, you can speak this more than I can, but is the best way, but we're going to have another option here soon for those that can't come in person. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is, is shooting is one of the, I mean, there's a lot of things right in the, I don't want to say in the sport world, but where you go and you can get in-person coaching or in-person training, right? Um, shooting is one of the few things where, you're, like I said in the beginning, you're doing it off a really shady or shaky ground, I would say, as far as what matters and don't. You have hunters that have hunted, but they're not good shooters. You have shooters that may be good shooters in a thing, but they're not good hunters. You know, your gun rider thing is like how many of those gun riders actually have any skill with a gun just because they shot quote unquote a lot. If you're not shooting in front of people and winning in something that is applicable to the task. So shooting, no offense, shooting a thousand yard bench rest does not have anything to do with Western hunting. Mm -hmm. That is not applicable. I'm sorry. Just like, well, other than the time factor and stress, just like shooting a USPSA doesn't have a whole lot to do with Western backpack hunting. Although it does teach you to shoot under stress and time. PRS and PRS is the same thing, right? When, when we were just talking about when the shot comes down to it's barricade bench rest prone off a bipod or tripod shooting with 29 pounds, six dashers that 
if you touch the scope, the point of impact changes because the whole thing is like, there's not a whole lot of applicability there. I'm sorry. Right. Like that gun right there that weighs four pounds, 10 ounces is a hell of a lot different than a 28 pound six dasher and shooting it the same and trying to recreate the same way doesn't work. So in person is the way, right? So I guess like one of the reasons that I kind of agreed to do this and like with Chris is because it should exist. I'm not saying people can judge the the thing on its own merit if they come to it or whatever. I'm not saying it's good or great or it's bad, whatever you do you, but it should exist and it needs to be around hunting and it needs to be around spot and stalk Western hunting and broken terrain. I would pay for it happily if it existed somewhere and it wasn't just a rebranded version of something else with some assumptions, but lots of people can't, you know, and I get a ton of questions on all of it, the basics to stuff that's advanced that just doesn't come across in text very well. So, you know, the idea came out of like, well, can we do an online version? And, you know, there was a lot of gnashing of teeth and I really don't want to do stuff, but Yes. The answer is yes. You really um, don't want to do stuff? Well, I don't. <laughs> like I told you, I just wish that somebody competent would come along and then I could just stop posting. Right? Like, it's the same thing. I don't. I'll ban them on rock slide. Yeah. Just, it's not a, it's not like form wants to be the name on anything. I don't care. Um, but so now the idea is like, you know, we came up, can we do an online thing that isn't online? Like you watch it. It's online where it's, it's coaching step by step, right? To the point that when you get to a lesson module, say uh, wind reading or say body position or something that, that matters or kneeling, you know, there'll be a discussion forum or thread or something where you can go on and actually ask us, maybe we review a video, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be like an hour a day that we're dedicating to each person coaching, but much more interactive between us and the people that that do it right because that's what's missing in this you can go to a course but there's you, you don't go to learn like uh baseball and you go to a week-long baseball camp and then that's it you just go play right you have a local coach you have local batting coaches local pitching co coaches local you know uh, strength and conditioning coaches well you, it's hard to have that right but what we can have is an online version of that where we do videos, they're step-by-step -step process that will get you way further. I would, for the vast, vast majority, it will get you way further into increasing your success rate. Lots of people kill stuff with no training, all that. I would say that if you've ever, if you've had a, an animal or animals that you're like, well, I wish I would have killed that and you didn't for whatever reason, that's what we're trying to solve. Right. So the online version will be similar to the course, but nothing done that's not in person is going to have the full effect, but it would certainly be worth it. Um, it's going to have a ton of information and it will start at the same thing. Like this is a gun from rifle setup, scope setup. And not specifically brands, just like how to assemble them for, for optimum, um, all the way to the quote unquote fundamentals, which are important because that's the foundation that every other thing is built on. And if you miss one aspect of that, you know, if you miss one aspect in lesson two, lesson 10, you're completely behind the power. You're losing. You have no idea what you're doing and you don't know why you're failing at it. So it'll be like that. And it will, you know, I can say that in the first eight to 10, maybe 12 videos, and they're talking like four or five minute videos, with just that alone, you can go to the range and practice these things and exponentially increase your ability with a gun, on-demand ability with a gun. And that's the first 10 videos or whatever. I think it needs to be stated. This isn't something you can just watch and think you're going to freaking no. have osmosis through the fucking TV screen and you'll be able to do it. This is something you got to do it step by step at the range. Yes. You, or, you know, wherever you shoot, you got to practice this. You're not going to learn it by just watching it. No, this is treated more like, um, like you would treat a sport, like a coach, right? So you have an online coach and you have a, a process to, to teach you how to dribble, how to pass, how to do free throws, layups, three pointers, all the way into like complex plays, right? That's kind of the idea.
The next question people are going to ask is when is it, when's it coming out? We are working on it hard right now. I, I don't know if anybody in here can tell us exactly when it's going to be done. But it's going to be it's going to be released in in modules. In modules. And and there will yep. be more to this than just shooting. Correct. Oh yeah. There will be uh we've kind of signed on some other professionals in their areas and there will be more to it for sure. Yes. Time frame wise to be continued. I don't know, to be determined, I guess. My goal's pretty cool. We'll have something <laughs> out by the end of the year. It's not going to oh, be the whole sure. shebang. Of- I just hate, you know, it's kind of like the rock stock. We promised something, then now we're getting the emails. So it's like, yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll be up and you'll hear it first. On oh, uh, I think it'll be a total failure on our part if we don't have the base enough to completely start training yourself how to use the rifle for hunting like we're talking about well in advance of hunting season. Mm-hmm. Like you will be able to be practiced by hunting season. On the training, did we miss anything? Anything else we need to talk about on that? I don't think so. So I want to hit on this. I think we have uh, we have one spot left for this year. Uh, Luke, throw up the date up there real quick. Would you? What is it? June fifteenth? No, seventeenth. June seventeenth. June seventeenth. We also have a spot left for bear hunters if you want to go, but you better happen go quick because end of the month, What's end that? of April. Let's see, June. Yeah, June seventeenth is a Monday, so it would start on June sixteenth on a Sunday and be done at the end of Friday on the twenty first. Mm-hmm. One spot left there, and then we have uh, several openings for next year. We got two zero to six hundreds next year, and then a six hundred to a thousand. You do have to take the zero to six hundred first. Yeah, yep, one left. One left. I mean, oh, yes. Left. And if you want to yeah, go bear not- hunting and get a quick three day course, we still have one spot at the end of April. Well, for next year, yeah, we got we got. Almost one zero to six is full, uh, seven spots and another zero to six and 11 spots on a 600 to a thousand. But there is yeah, a big the, PDF for the class on there. You guys can download now to give you kind of a general idea about what to expect from the class. Yeah. Don't plan on leaving Friday. If you come to the course, it's Monday through Friday, leave on Saturday. Oh, it was long leave days, lots of shooting. Yep. The, yeah. I can't impress them. I can't tell people enough because people don't shoot. You are shooting basically from 10 o'clock when Forum's done with his coffee until fucking dark. You get a little bit of food there and he's usually talking to you about some shit while you're eating. So it is an information dump. So it's not a, I like how Chris always says, it's not a fucking splash and giggle. This is going to be a fucking open up your mind and he's going to stuff information in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So long days. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the thing, cause it's, it's, you know, it's labeled a zero to 600. Um, you're going to do a ton, a lot of shooting past 600. I mean, last year, I think we shot to 1400 or something one day, 1200. I mean, 1,200 at least. I know we were shooting 1,250 for a while. But you're going to shoot a lot. Of, the The reason it's 0 to 600 is it's the basic, the foundation for being a rifleman first. And the goal is you are on demand under 600, right? So that is just a dead animal. We're shooting a lot past that. Um, we'll shoot as far as your turrets will dial and you can hold. Um, but we're just focusing on the zero to 600 first. And then like that, you know, it says 600 to a thousand, but just think long range shooting. Mm. On that note, I've gotten this question and it's good for you and Chris to answer this physical ability. What level do you need to be at for this class? In terms Mm -hmm. of fitness? Fitness. I would say if you can walk a mile without having a heart attack. Yeah, sure. The the big thing is, is ups and downs, right? And you're making and breaking positions. So you're going from a standing position, potentially to a prone position. Yeah, but we, I mean, we've had somebody with some severe... I mean, two summers ago, I wasn't exactly in yeah, the, true. the and, best uh, no, and it's, shape. So Yeah, I think uh, with what Form's saying is... If you can hunt. Yeah, and stretch would be my advice as well yeah, beforehand. Yeah. Stretch because we are in some awkward positions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so get some flexibility. But if you're, if you're in if modest you, if, shape... If, if you could do 10 up-downs in under a minute... Yeah, you probably are. Oh, no, you, you don't, have you to don't do need that. to do that. No, <laughs> yeah, no. There's plenty. not. There's not like long, lots of long distance it, walking or anything like that. We're walking in broken terrain. We're not doing. We're not. It's not CrossFit. No, it's not CrossFit. It's not even just a little bit. shooting just and shooting. shooting in a little bit of messed up positions. Yeah. So just yeah. yeah, yeah there's not. It's not a high degree of fitness standard. It's just a little bit of flexibility and long days. Mm. So staying hydrated and nourished and puts it, bring your sunscreen. Hopefully, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. It's fucking hot last year. You know, so. Grasping your mind around the fact that stay engaged from the moment we start, hundred percent, till the moment we say go to sleep. Be present. Yeah, be, be present, present and aware. Yep, that's right. Leave. That means uh, so there, there's no drinking allowed. Yeah, 
no drinking allowed. We will have the ability for like emergency calls and stuff, but there's not, you're not surfing the internet. Yeah. Be present. Yeah. Everything from like Ryan was saying from first, from mid morning, breakfast, coffee time, all the way till dark and dinner, mm -hmm. you're, you're learning and engage the entire And we're time. showing how to mount a scope and shit. So these guys, they, if they don't know what they're doing, they can bring their rifle and a scope could, separately and we're going to help can, you mount your you shit. You can show up without ever seeing a rifle in your life and mm. you will leave the course everything 450 to 600 yards and in is yours you don't even need a fucking rifle we'll have rental rifles on site that work don't even need a rifle that'll probably be the rifle you end up with either way yeah that'd, 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 that'd be, <laughs> that'd be, that'd be, story. That'd be rent, rent, rent to buy but we'll have stuff i mean there. that came out of the fact that like yeah we need rental guns but every year we've done this because this just started as like us doing it for friends and mm -hmm. a get together for a week we just kept being told like dude you guys need rifles to sell and we're but, like, i'm not a dealer i don't sell it. what are you talking about yeah there are guys that show up and you know by the end of the first morning they are wanting to borrow somebody else's rifle because what they brought they're realizing just didn't, it, it doesn't do what they thought it was going to do it's not the yeah. same so and yeah. hint hint it's usually a six creed or 223 <laughs> surprise so oh yeah tika all suppressed. Yeah. Rock stock. <laughs> the, the, rock, the rock stock will be new for the year, but yeah. yeah, yeah, I think you need one of those. <laughs> Speaking of rock stocks, I want to get the three of us, me, Forum Jake, biased. Um, Chris was one of the first, he tested out the rock stock. Can you go through what your thoughts are now that you've had it for a few months? Yeah, it's uh, it's been the answer, honestly, for field shooting uh, for me. One of the biggest things that I noticed right off of the bat is the lack of movement of the reticle on the target after the shot delivery. It just, the way that the recoil is transferred and your ability to maintain your sight picture on your target is markedly improved over anything I've ever shot, including chassis. And when you're talking a, a hunting weight rifle and moderate calibers, and I've, I've only shot it up to 308 in the rock stock, uh, the neutral grip, the short trigger reach, the ability to maintain that neutral grip, the felt handling characteristics. I know that's kind of a goofy thing, but it almost feels like an English game gun in terms of a shotgun. It just feels like it is designed correctly and that's kind of touchy feely, but it does offer objective and subjective improvements over anything that I've shot before. The cheek weld, the ability to get behind the gun, have straight line recoil path, have it functional in terms of being able to achieve a solid rest from field positions, backpack prone, uh, shooting sticks, and then that ability to control that recoil is better than anything I've ever shot. When you're running a, a rear bag, have you had any issues with the zero toe for micro elevation adjustments? Like people are, a lot of people are worried about the zero toe on no, the back I end. I for simply some change my hand pressure, whether it's off of a bag or my bino harness. Yeah. Change my hand pressure. But you're a bag squeezer. Uh, most of the time I shoot off my bino harness, so I generally don't use bags because I'm all about field shooting. Mm. Um, I have had the opportunity to try your new bag. I had a, an opportunity to shoot that and I liked it a lot and it's super lightweight and very functional in terms of the way the design is on that bag. But oftentimes I'm shooting off my bino harness. So it's a, it's a positional thing with my bino harness, whether I tip it, twist it, squeeze it. Whatever yeah, but the it idea is. is that you're manipulating your rear rest that, in uh, order to micro elevation adjust. You're not worried about the, the sliding of a wedge bag on a sloped stock to nope. make your micro adjustment. You know, not, the, it's not a thing. We, we keep asking guys like, what, what is the big deal about not squeezing the bag? And, and, and like we had Whaley in here the other day. Yeah. I don't, everybody's running comps with chassis with flat or back, you know, zero back ends and they have no Dude, it's, problems. It's, 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 not, it's, a not, thing. it's not an issue. It's not a fucking thing. And number one question I get is. Chris, is there a learning curve with this rifle Zero. stock? None. It's actually probably less of a learning yeah, curve than any it, other stock would be it, just because when you get into it and the sight doesn't move. It's easier to shoot, in my opinion, because of the way everything mounts up on your, whatever you're using for your positional shooting and your bags, your pack, your, whatever it is that you're using, it, it works better than anything that I've found because you don't have to monkey around with things as much well, as, you, as you had to. I mean, that's the whole stocks. idea behind the... The parallel four and parallel toe is all of it. But the problem when we have guns that are conventionally designed is you're fighting the position and the gun trying to do something. You know, how about the gun does what I tell it to do and only that? 
Like it's not, when it recoils, it's not moving in some way that I don't want it to, right? At least that's my perspective of what I want. I squeeze the bag. I control the rear bag. I don't want the gun sliding around doing anything I didn't tell it to do. The next question I get would be, it's got a 1.7 inch trigger pull and I have great big hands, which I do not, but you do. Have you any, any issues with that? It's a different feel than what you're accustomed to. If you use a Macmillan, a Manners or a general factory and pick a stock, right? But it is incredibly shoot shootable and it is, it almost becomes natural once you actually have your hand on the grip and your finger on the trigger, it ends up being there's there's no thought to it really it's just second nature and the, because you don't have to move your hand out of position in order to reach the trigger basically correct it just kind it's of holds a very hand. it's a very neutral grip and very minimal influence from your grip and your palm and your thumb everything falls in place where it should just naturally and yes it feels kind of like you're choking up in order to squeeze the trigger but it there's minimal learning curve at all i mean it's different Ooh. We were actually sizing up uh, when Colton was here yesterday and his 10 year old daughter with him. She did, she just killed her first turkey yesterday, but uh, we were actually sizing her up for a rock stock because he wants to build her a little Tika six mil something so she could start shooting. And we had her first just shoulder it. And the idea, we we're just basically trying to check length of pull. But by the time we had her laying down on the ground, because she could reach the trigger so easily, length of pull becomes kind of almost a nil point. I mean, there there is some point to it, but it's not nearly as drastic as what it is when you have a two and a half inch trigger pull where you're trying to manipulate and come out of position. I'll tell you one thing that I did notice is that the, with the, uh, with the comb, the way it is and using the TO 84 rings, I, I need to go to a little bit of a higher ring. So the UM ring solved that issue for me just with my eye position in the scope and the way things work, but that's an, that's an easy solution. It's, yeah, it's not really an issue. We definitely recommend a size up on the, yeah, on the height yeah. of your rings for most people. Because it does change your, your your position a little bit and I noticed it and, and it, not it it depends on how you shoulder the gun right so mm. I, I will say that if you shoot ARs and M4s and you're used to like nose to the charging handle or that kind of a aggressive forward head position it's probably not going to apply to you mm. if you're coming from bolt guns and your head is vertical and all this and you're already at a tight cheek weld, yeah, you're probably going to need to go up a ring size. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me. It's been like 50-50. Like I yeah. just had Lamper shoulder it and I have the mediums. He's like, man, those rings are too tall. So yeah. it's like right down, it seems to be 50-50. Mm -hmm. But again, easy solution. It, it yeah. is the the benefits of the stock, stock design and finally having something, even as unconventional as it looks, it's function. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a quality product, extremely functional, extremely shootable. It is a field hunting stock and that's exactly what it is. And it's, it's awesome. I am thrilled. I've got, uh, I think either I'm on my way to five, but, uh, <laughs> not there yet. <laughs> yeah, so the last question, everybody says that 12 degree, you know, half inch above bore can't be comfortable. Thoughts on that negative comb side of it. Comfortable. So, um, oh, I can't be comfortable because the way it looks. Yeah. I don't think yeah, you I, I, I'm just trying to figure out what, what the issue is and you need to shoot it because <laughs> I wish they could see his face. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those, there things. are such things as stupid questions and stupid <laughs> statements. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's it, well, put it this way, right? I mean, you, you go to a gun store and you pick up a, a handgun and, and everybody, the salesman behind the counter is wants you to feel something that feels good in your hand. Right. And you find something that feels good in your hand and it is unfreaking shootable relative to a 1911. And, Right. Am I wrong? Am <laughs> no, I wrong? It's, you know, it's, so uh, you know, a 1911, the most shootable handgun ever made in the, in the, in the history of handguns. And it's designed and designed for function. You get things that are designed for ergonomics that feel good, that objectively hinder performance. Mm. And in this case, I haven't noticed anything in, in degree of comfort. Is it different than anything you've used in the past? Uh, certainly it's different, right? It's different than, than most rifles. Uh, but comfort isn't a thing. It, it's shootable. And you put it in there. It's a, There are objective results that you can see when you squeeze the trigger in terms of spotting your hits and the crosshairs remaining where they are and the recoil straight back. It, it's it's a correctly designed functional field stock, mm. and I'm thrilled about it. We need to get that trigger cam up on one of those bad boys and make a little video. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that Ryan showed me I was retarded and it <laughs> yeah. can be fixed. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So it anyway. was a green screen. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Well, I, you know, on that, like, yeah, people say I'm biased or whatever. And 
if it sucked, I'd tell you it sucked. And everybody in this room has something that you guys would be biased about that I have zero issues and I do tell you it sucks or I don't like it or whatever and vice versa. And I've said since the beginning, like, I probably wouldn't, like, I wouldn't just go out and replace like a Tika stock, like a factory 223 Tika, throw a vertical grip on it, you're good. Um, um, I'm reevaluating that. So, you know, I hadn't really shot a factory Tika stock since I got the rock stock. I've been shooting the 308 and getting a lot of rounds through it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were there with Luke's dad shooting and he's got like the quote unquote rock slide special, the whole setup, 6X Waffa, Tika 223 cut, suppressed. And you had yours, which is exactly the same. Back to back, I mean, I literally just like, I got up and I'm like, I never want to shoot that stock again. Mm. The factory stock, like, I'm not saying rush out, that should be your primary thing, right? Buy a thousand rounds of ammo or whatever, but even on that gun, it makes you're not fighting the gun at all to get behind it and get it get it, it placed to shoot correctly you know and you don't really realize it until you go from something designed correctly that's at the same weight because every other stock that's designed pretty well is super heavy relatively speaking right you put a tika and a krg bravo with a raised butt pad and all that it's just a totally different thing it's when you go oh this is a 26 ounce stock and this is a 26 ounce stock and the rifles balance the same but this one doesn't move and this one moves a lot. Hmm. Well, we covered a lot of shit. Uh, we got to give some rings away. Did he text you? Yeah, let's see what jacked up name he gave us this time. Does he just <laughs> pick the oddest <laughs> names or what? Don't, no. give, don't give away the secret. Oh, okay. 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 <sighs> All right. If your name is Sean Sensky, I think that's how you say it. You want a set of rings. You can get premier rings or the Tika rings. Get a hold of us at podcast at shoot to hunt. Oh, we just added one inch. I was just putting it up on the website before we walked in here, but one inch Tika rings uh, in two heights, a uh, 0.900. I'm going to call them the micro and then a uh, 105, which is the low. So one inch Tika rings are uh, being manufactured as we speak. So you can buy them today. When do you get them? Uh, four weeks. Okay. Yep. All right. Sean Skin Sensky. Get what are you guys, what are you going to have your? Your core pick a tenny rings. Um, so what, what's happening right now is so they just made a bunch of move, room back here. They're buying a five axis machine, mm -hmm. and because of the popularity of all the ring lines so far, we're going to be moving all the rings to the five axis. Basically, what that means is that instead of having a bunch of different operations on one mill and so on, they they put it in one machine that does the whole fucking shebangus in one show, oh, right? So. All of it and it drops rings out. Yeah, they got a robot with it, all that shit. So they have to remake tooling, redesign programs. So we're waiting on the rest of the rings. That machine should be here in like four weeks. Okay. The first project on new said machine is I'm just going to say, we're just going to say they're going to be Tika Premier rings. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. So that'll be the first project. And then Jesus, the core I rings will come. thought that was a secret. It's not a secret no more. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yes. So yeah, that'll be literally the ring machine. So Midway's picked up the UM Premier ring line and the Tika ring line. They're hungry for more. We got two more lines of rings coming out. Uh, ha ha update. So Half-Ass Hunting Academy is happening May 4th and 5th. Um, everything is uh, looking really good. We still have some holes in the, uh, if you want to attend some classes, we still have some signups available. It's going to be an awesome event. There'll be some Friday night festivities for those that buy all the classes. Uh, mingle with the vendors, movie premiere. Uh, there'll be live music that night. Ryan's got a uh, a brewery coming out to host the alcohol. Is that correct? I haven't got to go, but I think it's pretty much going to happen. Yeah, so it'll be a fun night, Friday night, and then, of course, classes all day, Saturday and Sunday. You don't have to pay. It doesn't cost anything to attend the event. It only costs if you want to attend a class. So come uh, check out all the vendors. Uh, we got a long list. we got like 35 vendors or so, all kind of, uh, this is my invite-only, top-tier kind of companies, and uh, it's going to be a good time. If you want to learn a little more about hunting and maybe not be half-assed like the rest of us, then that's the place to be. I'm I'm mostly excited about the Chris Cornelius class. Oh boy! Yes. <laughs> so Chris is doing a wilderness medical class. Yeah, backcountry first aid. Yeah, it won't, yep. be, it won't be a me wilderness medicine as defined by their curriculum at all. It's a backcountry first aid. I'm a backcountry hunter and a paramedic, and we'll go from there. Nice. So hopefully, there's some good takeaways. We got caping. We have trapping 101. We got we got bear hunting 101. Yep. We have uh, match bullets for killing. We have a ballistic class. 
Uh, we're going to have a bag. We hope to still have a bag fitting class. We're hoping XO Mountain Gear is going to come up. Um, yeah, it'd be an awesome couple of days. And uh, Plus just being around a bunch of serious, yeah, oh, yeah. not so serious. Get out of cabin fever, come out, you'll have yep. fun. Good spring event. Yes. Oh, get, uh, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls putting on an elk calling competition. You can go sign up for that on, Luke, throw up what the name of that thing is where they sign up for the competition, would you? So you can sign up for the calling competition ahead of time. We have a game hunting simulation system where you actually get to shoot animals with an Oculus on mm-hmm. and people can kind of see what they're doing. Um, we have, what, what's the other competition? Oh, we got Coeur uh, Bowman coming out to do an archery competition. Ryan, you don't even know what the fuck's going on. I'm just showing up to talk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And making... people, people need to show up and tell Chris he's unethical for shooting elk with two, two, threes. Oh shit. Please do. <laughs> Love to have the conversation. If you, if you talk to Chris, yeah. you got to ask him about his road hunting prowess. <laughs> yeah. I guess the, po- the point of that is those <laughs> him and Robbie Denning. Yes, yeah. they, next year they're going to have a class. Nice. Hey, there's two. There's two guys in this room that own UTVs, right? Well, so anyway. there's three I'm guys. Not... There's three guys. Oh yeah. So go on. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah. Fuck. I still can't see what that name is at the top, Junior. What is that? Event Bright. Event Bright. Okay, yep. go on Event Bright and sign up for the Post Falls Bugle Battle. I have on good word that Mr. Ryan Avery himself is actually going to join the competition so we can all laugh at him. I'm on the amateur side. Yeah. Amateur. Yeah. But mm-hmm. there will be uh, just a ton of opportunity for to bingo with other hunters and whatnot. Like you're going to meet a lot of good people here, a lot of people that are in, you know, the the, the top end of the industry. They can meet and Randy with a guy. Oh, you can yeah. meet Randy with a guy. Randy with a guy. Randy yeah. with a yeah. guy. Yeah. Our second favorite ginger. He's volunteering, right? So have a yeah. have an orange shirt on. We have about 30 volunteers Pink. so far. Uh, what else are we doing? Oh, half price Cerakote. You can bring in a box of parts. It doesn't matter. You can Cerakote anything that doesn't flex, but single color Cerakote. We're not disassembling anything. So bring in your parts and they will be done that weekend. Half price free installations on any parts that you buy. Uh, Ken is going to be with Salmon River Solutions doing some CNC demos. If you want to see how CNC stuff works, we are giving away the rifle, um, well, the raffle the, rifle. The raffle rifle that you guys bought tickets for here about a week ago. We'll give it away then. We probably got 15000 bucks worth of giveaway shit on the tables. We'll be doing giveaways every hour. Mm-hmm. It's actually going to be awesome. Yep. Stone Glacier Rifles. Still giving that away. We're giving away a lot of shit. Oh, yeah. There's a Stone Glacier Rifle giveaway. If you go on to shoot2hunt.com, it's got a Maven scope on there. Oh, it's, it's we're drawing that April 15th. RS 1.2. Yep. Infamous. Drop test past RS 1.2. We actually have those in unknown now too. We could put those on your build if you'd like. For, Form loves the selling part. He like checked out like five minutes. He's all <laughs> yeah. checked out. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm out. He just wants 10. He he wants 25,000 bucks in ammo to shoot whenever he wants. He don't care about how the money comes about or where it comes. He just wants the fucking ammo. He wants to shoot. <laughs> Let me shoot. I want 12 rock. We asked him how many rock stocks he did. I need 12. <laughs> Motherfucker, you ain't shooting 12 <laughs> rifles out of there. He did make it funny yesterday. I called him about the pistol stuff, and he said, uh, I need a, what'd you say? I need a heavy one. He goes, I'll get it in like seven months. Yeah. I, said, <laughs> I was talking about one for the hammerhead. I'm like, I need a heavy one. And oh, the heavy rock stock. Yeah. Ryan's yeah. like, well, you know, something. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll get it in like seven months. He didn't I'm, tell you about my plan to, uh, so I bought fucking one inch, no, maybe they're three quarter of inch lead rods. Because when we were going to shoot the Night Force ELR, we were originally going to shoot a stock. And my plan oh. was to heavy the stock up yeah. uh, so we could drill into the butt stock back there, dude, and just load it with lead. Well, uh, Jessica said they're going to play with it and see yeah. if they can get, like, heavy fill. Well, this will make but it, if it That's what I'm saying. If this it doesn't still balance, then we'll take their heavy fill, drill it, and put those rods yeah. in. Yeah. How heavy do you want it? It's not, it's not a weight thing. I, I think it's going to have to be... It's a balance thing with the barrel that's on that, mm-hmm. right? Like it's gonna have to be. Since well, the plan the was like that fucking thirty inch, you know, one point two inch barrel. There, the plan was oh, just that, to load that it up back need here, fifteen pounds of yes. back, right? I got a lot of lead. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the rock stock, like in the back end for this gun, it's probably it's a Remington seven hundred, um, or it's a seven hundred base custom bat um, It's gonna take. It probably needs to be sixty ounces. What's the, what's it gonna be? It's the three oh eight. It's the hammerhead, the one that's in the chassis. We're gonna have to put a fucking warning label on the side of it. It's gonna say may cause cancer. That's right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> the other Tesla. <laughs> that much fucking battery weight. Yeah. Well, that's 